And uh, we're going to be taking our Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter number 27 this morning, Matthew 27. If uh, you know anything about the army or the armed service, those servicemen and women, you know that they have their own language. They have their own language. And uh, many times they, they speak in numbers, right? And uh, it's a language you can't understand or decipher because they are in code. But there are many terms that a soldier will use. And uh, that, that, that term is something that we as civilians are really unfamiliar with and we don't know what they are saying. I've heard some this week that I thought might be a benefit. Here's, here's one, grab some real estate. Now, if you've been in the Army or in the armed services of some branch, you probably understand what that means, but uh, we, we might not as civilians know what that means. Here's another one, uh, civvies, civvies. Now, Mike will say all the time, I'm going to go grab me some civvies. And I'm thinking... How many people are you going to grab, you know? <laughs> but apparently it means something different than that. Here's a couple more. Fourth point of contact. If you have been in the service, you probably understand what that is. Us, we might not know. Come up on the net, a high and tight. A police call. Now, we think as civilians, police call would be something. But as someone who has served, it's, it's totally different. Uh, another one is walking point. But all of the words that a soldier d do say, there is some words that a soldier doesn't say, such as do it yourself, right? <laughs> a soldier is never going to say that, right? Do it yourself. That's what, something that you don't say. Uh, there, it's in boot camp uh, when they're just getting these privates in and they're sitting there. Uh, this drill sergeant's going to burst through the door and they, they would never say do it yourself. But that, that drill sergeant comes in and he bursts through these doors and he says, you know, if guys, if it's okay with you uh, after a few minutes and if, you, if time spares, would, would you all make your bed, please, if, if it's okay? Is that what they say? Uh, veterans, is that what they say? A absolutely not, no. And what happens is this, this drill sergeant comes in and he orders them around. And there is great reason for that. And the reason is because every soldier needs to know how to quickly uh, respond, how to precisely obey commandments. And the reason is for their safety's sake. There's going to be a time in their days uh, in the service that they might have to obey a command very quickly uh, because of safety. But also every soldier learns how uh, they themselves can make quick and precise decisions on the field by simply obeying quickly. Now, these quick and sound decisions are very necessary. Uh, many times a soldier will be in the field and that decision that they have to make very quickly uh, is going to be a decision of life or death. And we come to the passage of Scripture here in Matthew 27 this morning with a soldier. Uh, we are at the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, but there at the foot of the cross is a soldier. He is in charge of this crucifixion. He has been given authority by the Roman government to crucify this man named Jesus. And as he is standing there looking up at the cross, as he is seeing the things unfold, uh, he has been trained to understand what kind of decisions to make based upon the circumstances that are around him. And in this uh, time, in this uh, portrait of the cross, in this day when he's standing at the foot of Calvary, at the foot of the cross, he makes a decision that cost him. It's a decision of whether life or death. And I want us to read that portion of scripture, if you would. Matthew chapter number 27. Look with me, if you would, in verse number 51. The Bible says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many." And when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things which were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Now, I want us to look at verse number 54 once again. And now when the centurion, this was that Roman official, that soldier of the Roman uh, army. And they that which stood with him, most likely other army uh, men, other officials of, of their services, Watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things which were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. This morning I want to preach on, with, with the help of the Lord on this subject, a soldier's confident decision. A soldier's confident decision. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessings on this service today. 
Lord, we love you, and God, we're so thankful to be gathered in your house once again, Lord, to be able to open up the word of life, Lord, that we might be able to see and clearly, Lord, understand what you have for us today. And God, I pray that you would be with a faulty tongue this morning, one that is very frail. God, and I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would move in the service. Lord, I pray that as I do my best to speak to ears, Lord, that you, as the Holy Spirit of God, would move upon the hearts of all that's here. God, I pray that you would be with each one. If there is one that's here lost, Lord, and having never received you as their personal Savior, God, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to their heart today, challenge them, convict them of where they're at, and God, help them to see in you the Lord Jesus, a Savior. Lord, we ask that you would be with this service, for it's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen and amen. Now, how many here today would categorize yourself as indecisive? How many, how many would say, you know, I, I'm a little hard on decisions? Anybody like that? Would you raise your hand up real high? I want to count you. It's mostly us women, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, w- sometimes we find it very hard to make a decision. You'll be in a place buying some furniture, and that's the one, and then you go to get the money out, and it's not, I don't know if it's that one anymore. Uh, some, a scenario that probably happens often in your life is that you and your husband or you and your wife get in the car and you're driving up the strip and you say, where would you like to eat today? And, and she always says, she always says, how many would always say agree? She always says, it doesn't matter to me, right? That's what she says. And uh, then you say, well, how about this place? And she says, it doesn't matter. Just go wherever you want to. And I said, and then I say, <laughs> yes. And then I say, <laughs> and then I say, once again, well, how about this, uh, this place? And she says, listen, it's your decision, Tommy. Just make your own decision, whatever you want. I'll pull into a place, right? You've been there a thousand times. I turn off the ignition. I hit the seatbelt, unbuckle it. I grab the door handle. She's still in her seatbelt. And I look over at her and say, are you coming? She says, you want to eat here? Amen if that's ever happened to you, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Sometimes it's very hard to make a decision. But a soldier doesn't have that opportunity. A soldier many times has to make a decision, and it's a cut decision, and then that's what has been made. Now, in the Bible this morning, what we find is a soldier making a decision to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He looked at that person hanging upon the tree and he says, surely this was the son of God. And I'm here to tell you this morning, the most important decision that a person will ever make in their life is what will they do with this man named Jesus? Will they trust him to be their personal savior or will they not trust him to be their personal savior? Will they put their faith in him as Lord of all or will they put them, their faith in something else? You say, Pastor, I don't know if I can make that decision. Maybe you're here and you've, you've never received Christ Jesus to be your personal Savior. And there's a lot of questions in your mind. Have I or haven't I or would I if I had the opportunity to accept the Lord Jesus Christ to be my personal Savior? Do I believe that he is the Son of God? Do I believe that he died sinlessly? Do I believe that he died in sacrifice for me and in substitution for me? Do I believe that I don't know if I can make that decision today? Well, then you've made your decision. Because a non-decision, right, is a decision. And so what we find in the text here is that this centurion who had just been guilty of piercing this man's side and blood and water coming out. He is the one that is guilty here standing at the foot of the cross for the execution of this man. And then he looks up at that cross and he says, truly. Now, in Luke's account, it will say certainly. So what he is saying, this is true. This is certain. I am very confident in my heart that this man was the son of God. You say, pastor, how do I get to that conclusion? How do I get to that decision? How how do I have extreme confidence as this centurion had? Well, I believe you have to see some things that the centurion saw. I believe you have to experience some things that the centurion experienced. The first thing that you'll see in this text that he experiences, he he can make this decision by what he saw on the scene. By what he saw on the scene. Now look at what he saw on the scene. Look at verse number 54 once again. Now don't miss this. The Bible says, now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus, notice this next word. What does it say? Saw, right? Here were some things that he saw on the scene. What were they? Well, number one, he'll see the earthquake 
And then the Bible says, and those things which were done. Now, there's a broad category of things that were probably done at this moment. These things that were done. And I'm going to tell you this morning that no doubt this centurion had been in charge of many crucifixions. There's not a doubt in my mind that the Roman centurion that was here speaking here in verse number 54 had been in charge of executions and had seen a lot of things happen at those executions. But what he saw on the scene that day was different than anything he had ever saw on any other scene, on any execution, on any other crucifixion. And what we're told in verse number uh, uh, 54 is that he saw the earthquake and those things. Pastor, what were those things? Well, if you will look at verse number 45, something very strange happens. Will you look at verse number 45? The Bible says in verse number 45, Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. Now, do you see what the Bible is showing us there? That there was darkness that covered the face of the earth there at Calvary. You say, Pastor, was it just a cloudy day that moved in? No, 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 no. That's not what happened. You say, was it just overcast skies that came over from the sixth hour to the ninth hour? No, that's not what happened. I believe with all of my heart for three hours in what should have been the brightness of the noonday sun. Uh, the sun of the sky quit shining. Why? Because the sun of the sky was hanging upon the cross. And he had no idea what to do. The sun in the sky, that is. He, he had no idea what to do. And I believe it was a darkness that was such that everyone wondered, is the sun ever going to shine again? We come to this place that the centurion is seeing all these things that are on the scene. But then in verse number 51 through verse number 53, he will name us three things that I want to point out and notice this morning because of the importance of its context. Notice some three things that he saw on the scene. Verse number 51, the Bible says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Well, you notice first what he saw in the scene was the veil of the temple torn in two. It was ripped in two. I love this picture. The centurion heard, no doubt, probably at one point would see this veil of temple, this fabric that was between the place in the temple from the holies to the holiest of holies. And this was a piece of fabric that was two inches thick. Now, not just fluffed up, right? But it was a piece of fabric that was woven two inches thick. And it served not as something that was laid down, but it served as something that was stood up. And this veil of the temple was a picture that we do not have access to God. You see, it was a separation. It was the divider from the presence of God from man. No man could come in there at least one, just at one time of year. And they had to be under very strict. It was only supposed to be the high priest. But that veil served as the reminder that we do not have access to God. That you do not have access to God. Why? Because of our sin. Now, the Bible says that God is holy. He is without sin and he can't even look upon sin. So that veil served as a reminder that we could not stand in the presence of God. But notice what Jesus is doing. Jesus is dying upon the cross. And when he gives up the ghost, the Bible says that that veil of the temple, that, separator, that separation between man and God, that access point now has been torn. And notice in which direction it was torn, right? What was it torn from bottom, from man to God? Was that how it was torn? Absolutely not. The Bible says that it was torn from top to bottom. You know what God was saying? He was saying the sacrifice for sin has now been done, done and clear. Now we can have access to God. How, Pastor? By the man, Jesus Christ. Amen. God in the flesh. 100% God, yet 100% man. Jesus died on the cross and the Bible says the veil of the temple was ripped in two from top to bottom. And the reason why is because that signified for us, that signified for us that now Jesus had conquered sin. Amen. The second thing we're going to find is this earthquake. Look at verse number 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. The earth did quake and the rocks were rent. 
Now, what we find is that he is looking on the scene of this of Calvary and he's hearing and he's seeing that the veil of the temple was rent. He's seeing now this earthquake that is shaking the ground there. There were only a couple times in the Bible where God would reveal to us in his word that the earth did quake. This actually, here in Matthew 27, is the last time the Bible at the crucifixion of Christ will ever mention that the earth quaked. Uh, it, it's, it's its last mention. But do you remember the first time it was ever mentioned? Anybody, anybody know the first time it was, it was mentioned that the earth did quake? Well, well, I had to take you back to the book of Exodus. And I, I would have to take you to a man named Moses. Who, who was there under the inspiration of God, he went up to this mountain and there God with his finger wrote the Ten Commandments, right? And the Bible shows us there that the earth did quake in the giving of the law. And the last time, that was the first time, the last time the earth did quake according to the scripture, the Bible last time it mentions it is here. Why? Because the law has been completed. It has been fulfilled. So what we see in this veil of the temple is now Jesus has conquered sin. This earthquake signifying that now Jesus has conquered the law. He lived in every jot and tittle, a perfect man. And then thirdly, I want you to notice this last one. It says in verse number 52, and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Do you see what the Bible just says there? The graves were opened. Now, how many get a little fainty when you think about graves being opened, right? Uh, I have a pastor friend who, a uh, pastor, youth pastor for many, many years. Now he's in evangelism. And he was saying one time that when he was a youth pastor, every year he had what they called fright night, fright night. And uh, what they would do is they would advertise it with their teens and the teens would bring people to this because everybody knows that teens love to be scared silly, right? They, they love that. And so they had this fright night and every year they would go to the graveyard, every year. He said one of their highest times they had about 250 teenagers come out for fright night and they had to do five trips to the graveyard. And so what happens is he would get to the graveyard where his uh, friend was in charge, the groundskeeper there. And he had already arranged all these things and they were walking through the graveyard. He was always in front, he said, and they were all you know, like stick, stick to, stuck to him on the backside as he was walking through this graveyard. And uh, he said that they would get to a portion of the graveyard there in the back and they would see turned over dirt, fresh soil. And behind that mound of dirt was a casket. And he would say, oh, no, guys. And they would see that casket. And now it's dark, okay? And it's late October, so it's cold and it's dark. And they're sitting out there. And those, he says, every girl, when they saw that casket, were shivering. I mean, just the uncontrollable shiver. And the, and the boys were always crying <laughs> when they saw that casket. And uh, he would get to the point where he would say, now, guys, go over there and, and just open it. Just see what's in there. And he said none of them would. Finally, he would convince the one boy that thought he was the biggest, toughest guy in the youth group. You know what I'm talking about? You know who those guys are, right? Who thought they was the biggest of it. And he said he would sneak up to that casket <laughs> every time. He would sneak up to that casket and he would get to the, the lid of it. He would throw it open and then he would what? Run. He would run every time. He said that it happened every single year just like that. And he ran backwards and nothing happened. Nothing popped out. Nothing came up and said boo. And uh, he, he would say, well, let's go see what's in it. And they were all, you know, just stuck right behind him. And their eyes were trying to peer over. They finally get up to the casket and nothing was there. To their relief, the sigh of relief, there was nothing there. And about that time, he would turn around to them and say to them, guys, you don't understand. There's only one thing scarier than a coffin with no one in it. It's a coffin with somebody who used to be in it. <laughs> and about that time, one of his teen workers was behind them, their backs uh, to, the, to him, and he had this suit on that was like a mummy. And, oh, and he said they would faint like a goat right there. They would just faint. They would die scared right there in the, in the, in the graveyard. Well, the Bible here, and I would have been right there with them. The Bible here says, 
that in verse number 52, when Jesus Christ died for all man's sins and paid that price, here's what the Bible says, many of the saints which slept arose. The graves were open. And these weren't people with half a face, okay? That's not what this, this is talking about. These were people who, whose bodies were made whole and God raised them out of the grave and they walked among them. Now think about this. This centurion, this Roman centurion, who has been made a man of decision. He has been trained to be a person who observes all the circumstances. Looks at what is happening on the scene. And his heart is tendered to that Jesus Christ is the very Son of God. Amen. Why? Because of what he saw on the scene. But secondly, I want you to notice, not only by what he saw on the scene, but secondly, by what he saw in the Son. Notice what is happening here in verse number 54. The Bible says, Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly. Do you see what the Bible is showing us here? That although these miraculous, marvelous things are happening, the graves are being opened, the earth is being quaken, there is darkness over the face of the earth. All of these things are happening, yet let me ask you, where are their eyes fixed? What are they watching? Notice that although these things are taking place, their eyes are fixed on a man, on this one who is hanging upon the cross. The Bible says that they are watching Jesus there. They saw the sun, and although these things were happening, they could not get their eyes off Jesus. You see, these soldiers have been in charge of many crucifixions. They have saw many executions, but they had never experienced a man go through as much pain and agony as Jesus went through and do what Jesus did and say what Jesus said. Think about what is happening at the crucifixion. Think about what is, is, has, has taken place. Jesus on that day has been falsely charged. He's dying for transgressions he never committed. And everyone knew that. That was something that Pilate saw and that's something that every soldier saw. He saw this man dying for things that he did not do. And not only that, but he had saw this man's beard be plucked out by a hands. He had saw this man be beaten with a cat of nine tails with 39 stripes. He had saw this man be set in a chair blindfolded and buffeted with a fist. He had saw this man be spit upon. He saw this man do all those things. Yet Jesus Christ said to, to his father up above while on the cross, he says these words, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Can you imagine that? A man who is innocent being taken through all of these things saying, forgive them. This is what he saw in the son. But not only did he see that in the son, he saw that him saying, father, forgive them. But he also saw this man being stripped of his garments in shame and nakedness. Yet although he was there on the cross in shame and nakedness, he was dying with grace and he was dying uh, with dignity. They saw Jesus giving a thief a promise of eternal life who just moments before that thief was mocking him and cursing him. They saw him in love provide financial arrangements for the well-being of his mother. They saw him talking to God as a man would talk to his own father. And they heard him say with great agony, it is finished. And at that moment when Jesus says it is finished, the Bible says that his soul departed from him. He gave up the ghost. It was like he was calling the shots. He died as he said it is finished. This centurion had seen many deaths, but none like this, this man's death. The, the centurion had saw many people die, but none like Jesus. And when he sees what is happening on the scene and he sees what's happening in this man, here's what he says. Truly, certainly, with confidence in my heart, this is the Son of God. Can I say you'll meet a lot of people on this journey? You'll meet a lot of men and a lot of women along this journey. But you'll never meet another person like Jesus. Amen. Never a person so forgiving. Never a person so kind. Never a person so humble and gracious and generous. Never a person so loving. Never a person so patient and merciful. Never a person able to give you eternal life. You say, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the things that I've committed against this Jesus. 
You know, the truth is, I don't. But you know what? Christ does. Christ does know what, what you have done. And here's what he said. Come. Come unto me. All you that labor and heavy laden, all those that have the, the burdens of sin, the burdens of hopelessness, the burdens of, of all of the transgressions, all you that are he, uh, burdened and heavy laden, here's what he says. And I will give you rest. Isn't that sweet? This is what he saw in the sun. No, number three, I want you to notice by what he sensed in his heart. By what he sensed in his heart. When we come to verse number 54, it not only tells us that he saw some things happening on the scene. And not only does it say that he saw some things in Jesus. They watched him there. But notice what it says in verse number 54. And those things which were done. Notice the next words, these next three words. The Bible says they feared greatly. When they saw all these things that were done. This vision from outside in created a feeling on the inside. And let me tell you, it was a feeling of fear. The Bible says that they feared greatly. As if not only what was happening on the outside was enough. And as not only what they were seeing in Jesus was enough. There's this feeling in their heart. Now this was a normal day, but it was un unnormal uh, circumstances. And after everything he saw, there was something exploding in his heart that he could not deny. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a service where a lot of things are happening on the outside? The singers are singing. The preacher is preaching. You're seeing all these things happening. But something in your heart just exploding your heart and making it bounce and, and pop and pump blood. I, I'm going to tell you, I'm thankful for the presence and the tenderness of the sweet Holy Spirit of God. You say, Pastor, why... Pastor, why was he fearing greatly? Because think about it. The Bible says after he fears greatly, he looks up at the cross, he sees this man dying on the cross, and he says, truly, this is the Son of God. But think about it. Who was responsible for that man's hole in his side? It was that centurion. Who was responsible for the nails in his hands and in his feet? Who was responsible for that? Who did it? Well, it would have been that centurion who is responsible for a crown of thorns a mockery being plated on his head who was responsible for that the centurion was who is responsible for putting up this this sign above it saying king of the jews who is responsible for that that mockery who was responsible i'm gonna tell you who it was it was that centurion it was that centurion with a spear in his hand and the, the hammer at his feet looking up at this man and realizing, finally coming to the conclusion that he just murdered. What does he say? The son of God. Could you imagine the fear? But here's the truth. He physically had the spear in his hand and the hammer at his feet. But spiritually, you have the spear in your hand. Spiritually, you have the hammer at your feet. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Whose sin did he die for? Remember that time when you grievously disobeyed the word of God? You remember that time when you stepped out of the bounds of Holy Scripture? And done something that you were not supposed to. Do you remember that time? How many remembers that time? Let me tell you. That was the sin he was dying for. It was our transgressions that nailed Jesus to the cross. We are the centurion. We are the soldier. We are the one guilty of nailing Jesus to the cross. It was our sins that held him to the cross. I love that song. It wasn't the nails that held him there. It was your sin and my sin that held him to the cross. Let me ask you a question. Have you been to the place where by faith, like that centurion, you look up at Jesus and say, truly, he's the son of God. Have you been there? Have you come to the place in your life in faith that says, I believe that Jesus Christ died a sacrificial death, was buried in a borrowed tomb, 
rose again the third day and will give eternal life to anyone who will receive him by faith. Have you come to that conclusion? Have you come to that place? I pray that every person here today has just like this soldier stood and said, by faith, that is the Son of God. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 10, verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, what does it say? Thou shalt be saved.